Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. And I want to thank uh, Publish What You Pay Norway and Amnesty International for inviting me to be here. So once again, with that, uh, l let me just, by way of a small personal introduction, just tell you that my name is Daniel Reeves. Um, I recently retired last year after spending 35 years with the United States Internal Revenue Service as a uh, IRS agent investigating primarily uh, offshore tax evasion and international money laundering. Um, so what I'm going to bring to this discussion is not the perspective of an academic or an attorney uh, or a policymaker. I'm going to be bringing the perspective of a uh, law enforcement officer, a regulatory compliance officer, someone who has investigated offshore uh, for a large part of my life. Uh, what I want to start by telling you is that offshore has become very big business. Uh, it is a, a, a very large business. Um, there was a time when offshore was really something that belonged only to the very wealthy. It was a rich man's game. Uh, but it's not just the fabulously wealthy anymore who take advantage of offshore. Today, with the growth of the global economy, with uh, the development of the internet, and the resulting ease of moving funds around the, uh, around the world, um, there has been an explosion in the growth of offshore. A recent report by the Tax Justice Network estimates that more than 32 trillion U.S. dollars are hidden, uh, of wealth are hidden in offshore bank accounts. Uh, and these are hidden in more than 80 offshore secrecy jurisdictions. Uh, various estimates have placed the loss to the United States Treasury alone at between 40 and 100 billion dollars per year. Uh, the recent high-profile investigations that were conducted of UBS AG and uh, Wegland Bank of Switzerland and also of HSBC uh, in India and the Stanford Financial Group uh, have really shown that these activities, if anything, have been growing and becoming significantly larger. Uh, they have also shown that there is a considerable uh, cadre of offshore professionals uh, who are there primarily to facilitate and enable this type of activity. And this cadre is made up of attorneys and accountants, private bankers, wealth managers, uh, corporate service providers, uh, financial advisors, and others. Uh, these are people who primarily are involved in teaching people and assisting people in hiding their wealth and basically finding ways to avoid complying with their own home country's tax laws. Now, what are the important uh, issues um, that are here? Uh, first of all, ta offshore tax evasion is all about creating the appearance of international legitimacy while actually disguising who owns the money, who uh, beneficially owns the money, while also ensuring that that person retains control and access to the funds whenever they want it. Uh, it's about form rather than substance. It's about appearance rather than reality. It's about fiction rather than fact. Aided by professional facilitators and enablers, taxpayers and their financial advisors will often de develop elaborate and complicated offshore tax schemes designed to create this appearance of uh, international legitimacy, while in reality, these will be nothing more than shams. These complex financial uh, arrangements uh, are designed to disguise what is really taking place uh, and disguise the economic realities of, uh, of the transactions involved. They often involve the use of multiple offshore shell companies and other kinds of entities uh, to disguise the, uh, the ownership. But at the core of every offshore tax scheme will be an arrangement that allows the taxpayer or the, the uh, beneficial owner to retain control uh, of the money and access to the money whenever needed. Now, offshore secrecy uh, laws have been enacted in many offshore secrecy jurisdictions. Uh, and these prevent the disclosure by bank employees, by attorneys, and by others of any of the information associated with those accounts. Some jurisdictions, such as uh, Switzerland and, and, uh, and um, Liechtenstein, have even made the disclosure of this information a criminal offense uh, that can be punished with imprisonment. Uh, now, by providing the means and the opportunity for concealing ownership and control of offshore assets, the relationship between supposed unrelated uh, companies uh, and the economic realities of what are actually taking place. Uh, financial secrecy jurisdictions have created uh, a culture of secrecy that allows them to be very attractive to those who are trying to hide money and avoid taxation. And I want to emphasize here that I'm not talking about financial privacy. I'm not talking about the kind of financial privacy that all of us expect in our private uh, lives. I'm talking about absolute, total, 
financial secrecy. No one but you and your banker knows or has the right to know anything about your financial affairs. And this kind of secrecy opens it up not only to tax evasion, but, but to all kinds of other kinds of activities that are uh, clearly illegal and clearly uh, frowned upon by, by civilized society, uh, including money laundering, uh, narco-terrorism, uh, terrorist financing, uh, human trafficking, and all of the other kinds of heinous activities that, uh, that uh, we all are opposed to. So who are these professional facilitators and enablers? Uh, well, first of all, they are the uh, offshore jurisdictions themselves. They are the financial institutions that provide the activity. And these are not just financial institutions within the secrecy jurisdictions. Um, there are financial institutions within all of the uh, developed world, including New York City and Los Angeles and San Francisco and elsewhere uh, that are involved in this kind of activity. They are using the secrecy provided by offshore secrecy jurisdictions to make it happen. But it is not just those that are located physically within the uh, secrecy jurisdictions. The, uh, the offshore jurisdictions provide financial secrecy laws. They provide low or no tax on the conduct of business that takes place outside of their borders. They provide favorable laws for corporations, trusts, foundations, and other legal entities or arrangements. And they work closely with the offshore financial sector in making all of this uh, work. Financial institutions which are the banks, private investment companies, brokerage firms, and insurance companies, um, and as I said, domestic or foreign, uh, they actively promote offshore investment. They assist in the creation and the execution of offshore schemes and offshore entities. They facilitate the covert control of, of offshore and onshore assets, and they provide false documents and statements when, ne when needed. The offshore professionals are the attorneys, the accountants, the promoters, the trust companies, the trustees, the private bankers, the brokers, the financial advisors, and the company service providers who are at the root cause of all of this. Offshore professionals provide for an entree and access into the offshore financial world. They also create the offshore schemes, they form the offshore entities needed, they open the offshore accounts, and they assist in the covert transfer of funds when needed. Working together, they create an environment of anonymous ownership of assets and discrete control that allows beneficial ownership uh, to be hidden. So, so what is the basic structure of all of this? What exactly do they do and how do they do it? Uh, well, basically what happens is that, uh, is that they will set up a, an offshore entity of some sort in a secrecy jurisdiction. Uh, in this case, we're talking about an IBC or an international business company. Uh, you heard in the cartoon, they said that in the British Virgin Islands, there was over a half a million uh, uh, offshore entities created. This is what they create in the British Virgin Islands, is IBCs, international business companies. Uh, they will create an IBC. You will be identified as the, uh, as the owner of the IBC. Uh, the IBC will then be used to open up offshore bank accounts. You can then start moving your money to the offshore jurisdiction. If you need the money, you can access it through debit cards, credit cards, wire transfers. There is a variety of ways that you can do it. Uh, but essentially, you now have put in place a very simple and basic offshore tax scheme uh, that allows you to move money, and nobody but you and your private banker will ever know that you are actually the owner of that IBC, ergo the owner of the money that's in the bank account. If you want to get a little more elaborate, you can put an offshore trust on top of this. Now, in addition to having an anonymous corporation, you have a, a trust. If any law enforcement agency or tax authority uh, wants to identify who the owner of that bank account is, first they've got to find their way through the trust. Now they've got to find their way through the uh, IBC. And then when they get to the bank, they've got to prove that it's your money in the, uh, in the bank account. And if they're really smart, they're going to put the, 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 the uh, trust in the Cook Islands, they're going to put the IBC in the British Virgin Islands, and they're going to put the bank account in Switzerland. Now you've not only got three different kinds of entities to work your way through, you've got three different legal jurisdictions to work your way through. It becomes exponentially harder and harder and harder for law enforcement and tax authorities to do, and that's precisely why they do it. Because they hope that at some point they will simply fold the tents and move away. Now, sometimes these are very simple, as I've described here, but sometimes they get very complicated. 
This is an example of a strategy that was actually developed. You'll notice at the lower right, lower left hand corner, this was an exhibit that was included in a uh, congressional hearing held in Washington, D.C. by Senator Carl Levin's permanent subcommittee on investigations. And they looked at this particular offshore tax scheme, which was described as the point strategy. Uh, the point strategy was, uh, was, uh, a, a, was used to uh, create uh, billions of dollars of false and phony capital stock losses, which were then used by purchasers of this uh, scheme to offset real capital gains. So in other words, what they did is they took real capital gains upon which they owed taxes, and they avoided paying their taxes by offsetting them against losses that were only on paper. They never actually occurred. And we were talking about billions and billions of dollars. Essentially, everything you see here is a is paper. It's, there's nothing really taking place. It's just create a company, create another company, this company deals with this company, they take the loss, they move it over here, and it just shifts around in a big circle, and at the end of the day, you create billions of losses, which are somewhere out there in the atmosphere, and you use those to offset real taxable capital gains and save yourself tens of millions of dollars of tax. This point strategy was carried out under the secrecy laws uh, of the Isle of Man and the Cayman Islands that allowed for these security transactions and entities to remain hidden. It was reviewed by very prominent US law firms that collaborated in the, with the promoter in the development of this strategy uh, to support the legitimacy of the tax losses. Uh, very prominent U.S. and foreign financial institutions provided the financing, planning, and technical assistance for the execution of the transactions, knowing full well that this was an offshore tax scheme. At the end of the day, however, the, all the transactions were phony and no real losses were ever generated. In another example that was submitted to the same hearing, uh, they do, the committee documented how two very wealthy uh, brothers in, uh, in Texas controlled, personally enjoyed, and beneficially owned millions of dollars in securities, real estate, business ventures, art, and jewelry through a single offshore structure that involved the use of 19 offshore trusts, 39 offshore corporations, and multiple offshore jurisdictions. Now those who work in the offshore industry will often tell you that it's not their responsibility to enforce the tax laws of other countries. Uh, and they will tell you that they are simply providing a service that is in demand and a service that is perfectly legal within their home country. But the recent high profile investigations, criminal investigations, uh, conducted into uh, UBS, Weglin, uh, and others have clearly shown that they do far more than that. Uh, in uh, February of 2009, UBS AG uh, of Switzerland uh, entered into a deferred prosecution agreement with the United States government in which it admitted to having conspired with U.S. citizens to engage in tax evasion. Uh, it didn't just do this by sitting in Geneva or Zurich or, or Lucerne waiting for Americans to show up on their doorsteps. It did this by sending their private bankers into the United States where they engaged in illegal banking activities uh, while standing upon the sovereign soil of the United States of America. This wasn't Swiss bankers doing what they do legally in Switzerland. This was Swiss bankers doing what they were doing illegally in the United States. They ultimately agreed to plead guilty to a criminal charge. They paid a $780 million fine. They agreed to exit the US cross-border business. Uh, and they provided the IRS with records of approximately 5,000 high wealth uh, US clients. In January of 2013, Weglin Bank the oldest private bank in Switzerland, founded in 1741. Um, it pled guilty in New York City to criminal charges that for nearly a decade, the firm had helped more than 100, 100 wealthy American customers evade taxes by hiding more than $1.2 billion uh, in secret accounts. Uh, bank officials acknowledged at the, uh, uh, that the bank had campaigned UBS's departing US tax evading clients. Uh, to move their accounts from UBS to Weglin where they could continue to remain secret and tax free. 
they also acknowledged at, at, before a federal judge in New York City that they believed they could not be prosecuted because they had no physical presence in the United States. Uh, and in what was a, seen as a startling admission um, of particular interest, they said that this kind of practice was a common practice within the Swiss banking industry. criminal charges. Uh, it paid $74 million in fines, restitution, and forfeited funds, and it has now closed its doors and is no longer in operation. The particular disturbing trend um, in, in offshore tax evasion has been the steady blurring of the distinction between what constitutes tax evasion and what constitutes tax avoidance. There was a time when it was pretty well understood by everybody, this is tax avoidance, this is, which is legal. This is tax evasion, which is illegal. But there has been this steady blurring about the distinction between the two, and this has allowed some attorneys uh, to begin becoming involved in actually facilitating and enabling this activity. In some cases, believing that what they're doing is perfectly legal. Uh, offshore uh, tax schemes are marketed on a supposition that what is taking place is perfectly legal. And these schemes are usually developed by private bankers, accountants, and financial advisors, and are then reviewed by attorneys who give them the legal stamp of approval. More often than not, these legal reviews look only to the substance, to the structures that are involved, and the form of the arrangement, rather than the substance and economic realities of what is occurring. If you think about that point strategy, that was reviewed by very prominent US law firms, but they didn't look at whether or not this was generating real losses. They just looked at the structure involved and said, yes, if this happens and this happens, then therefore it's okay. In some cases, attorneys even work directly with private bankers in developing uh, these very schemes. And in some cases, law firms actually offer a, soup to nuts operations where you can go to the law firm and the law firm will actually handle all of the business activities of going offshore from setting up the corporation to finding the nominee directors for you to moving the money for you. And there are a few law firms that do this that actually advertise on their websites. The best part about using a law firm to do this rather than a private banker is that all of your communications with the law firm are protected by attorney-client privilege. In other words, the private banker does this and he or she can go to jail. The attorney does it and is protected by privilege. Now, in August of 2006, uh, the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations issued a report titled Tax Haven Abuses, the Enablers, the Tools, and Secrecy, after conducting an extensive investigation into how offshore and U.S. financial professionals help U.S. citizens conceal um, and secretly utilize offshore assets, bank accounts, and such. Uh, at the end of the report, the subcommittee dedicated an entire section um, to the involvement of law firms in, sp in, in, uh, in facilitating and, and enabling uh, the abuse. This is the last section of the report. The report is about this thick, it's about three inches thick, and this is the very last section of it. In that last part, the report states, the evidence reviewed by the subcommittee shows that a battery of law firms was integral to the design and implementation of the tax and offshore structures discussed in this report. With respect to claims of privilege and its impact on the subcommittee's investigation, the report went on to say, and this is a quote, the subcommittee's access to documentary evidence from the law firms was limited, and representatives of the law firms were constrained with respect to some of the matters they could discuss because much of the material was subject to claims of attorney-client privilege. It was therefore difficult to determine in many instances all of the facts the law firms used in formulating their opinions and advice, and precisely what advice the law firms actually provided to their clients. Nonetheless, the subcommittee was able to obtain sufficient evidence to document the critical role played by law firms and to show that the activities and transactions reported in previous sections took place with heavy involvement and reliance on legal counsel. The report then concludes with the statement, the evidence reviewed by the subcommittee raises serious questions about the facts the law firms used in formulating and providing their opinions, services, and advice. What advice was actually provided to the clients in some circumstances, and whether the firms had adequate practices in place to identify and review client matters that could pose significant controversies. At issue is whether and to what extent professionals, including lawyers, 
have an obligation to evaluate the facts underlying the transactions to which they opine and advise. Again, that's a quote from, from the report. You remember the point strategy we talked about a few moments ago? The, uh, the tax attorney in Seattle, Washington, who was involved in developing and approving the offshore tax scheme was indicted on criminal uh, charges of conspiracy to defraud the United States, tax evasion, counseling false tax filings, wire fraud, and conspiracy to launder monetary instruments in connection with the scheme. Another tax attorney in Los Angeles, California, was separately charged with conspiracy to launder monetary instruments in connection with one of his clients who invested in the scheme. Both attorneys pled guilty and were sentenced to long prison terms, fines of more than $7 million, and forfeitures of approximately $23.1 million in back taxes. In connection with their status as, a, as attorneys, at their sentencing, the judge issued the following statement. You were the ones who were supposed to stand up and say, this is criminal. This is fraud. We could go to prison. Then if nobody listened to you, it was your responsibility to walk away. Right now, there are about a dozen U.S. lawyers who have been uh, sent to prison or are, fa or are under indictment awaiting trial right now for having engaged in the business of assisting their clients in um, going offshore and in managing their offshore assets. In other words, they were not providing legal advice. They were fulfilling the role of the private banker. And that's what's at issue here. Okay. I mentioned earlier that um, about the offshore leaks investigation that was released by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. It's really interesting that just this morning, this headline appears uh, in the Swiss media. Quote, offshore leaks, Swiss version, points finger at 200 to 300 Swiss lawyers. The article goes on to say that 200 to 300 Swiss lawyers who have helped wealthy people avoid paying taxes encouraging them to, by encouraging them to open up secret offshore company bank accounts are among the first to be named in the report. It points out that these are lawyers in Switzerland who are protected not only by absolute financial secrecy laws, but absolute legal privilege. And the article goes on to say that there is a consensus building in Switzerland to change this. Interesting that Switzerland is starting to think about the very same subject that you're here to discuss, as I understand it. Now, while the rules related to uh, attorney-client privilege vary by country, the general standard that applies to all is that the privilege is there to protect the client, not the attorney. Uh, it allows the client to be able to discuss candidly and openly um, legal matters with their attorney without fear of prosecution or that their comments will be disclosed to law enforcement or to government officials. Uh, it is not intended to provide a safe haven for clients to be able to uh, hide their money or to be able to use the, 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 the practice of law as a way to uh, uh, engage in unlawful activities or hide behind the protective shield that a law practice performs. Uh, there, there is a very familiar saying, I think we're all familiar with it, that says power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, well, the same can be said about absolute financial secrecy. Uh, financial secrecy, absolute secrecy is not needed by people who are not engaged uh, in illegal activities. Uh, and so unfortunately it can also be said uh, in certain cases about uh, absolute legal privilege. And I just want to close first by, by saying that clearly the legal profession and legal privilege are vital noble and necessary components of a free society. Uh, and, 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 and I want to emphasize that far and away most lawyers and law firms carry out their responsibilities with distinction, with honor, and with integrity. And it's not my intention in any way uh, to suggest that they do not. Uh, attorneys represent the legal conscience of society and they should always act to protect their client's interest by ensuring that their clients do not run afoul of the law. The attorney's mandate should always be to help the client avoid breaking the law rather than helping them circumvent, undermine, or violate the law. Nor should they be helping uh, clients uh, market financial products to others that are based on false legal representations. Unfortunately, the growth of the global economy, the ease of conducting cross-border transactions, and the absolute secrecy provided by offshore secrecy jurisdictions have caused some to see very little difference between legal tax avoidance and illegal tax evasion. And when that happens, we all lose. Thank you.